Hello everyone, welcome to the second part of my two-part interview with Intel's Senior Principal Engineer of Performance Tuning and Overclocking Architecture. We continue our conversation around DDR5 memory, the Core Ultra CPUs and their IMCs, discussing overclocking margins, DRAM topologies, DRAM records, and all sorts of interesting things around DDR5. Is there any risk of users running to the CPU itself, not necessarily the memory, running voltages uh, that are like higher than 1.5 volts for normal everyday use, extended use? Yeah, good question. So uh, it's something actually I've been studying a lot uh, with, with the team uh, at Intel uh, lately because uh, we're trying to revisit some of those uh, thresholds, uh, mainly to give, to give guidance uh, to users. So, the, okay, there's a number of rails. We talked about the rails on the PMIC, that's internal to the module. But on the motherboard, there's a voltage rail called VDD2. And this uh, voltage is uh, what our memory controller uh, would be exposed to. So that's what I'm going to reference now. So the, the, the nominal for that is 1.1 volts. So that means our like in spec would be around 1.1 volts. Um, and anytime you raise the voltage above our spec, you are incurring some form of risk. So I want to be clear about that, but I'm about to give you a little relief because you're definitely incurring risk, but, uh, the 1.4 volts, uh, has, has, um, uh, seem to be pretty low risk. And I told you we were studying that because, you know, we're asking, hey, you know, is there more we could do here in terms of guidance because there are special programs we can run around this or to bring attention to the fact that if you buy a module and a board that are capable of achieving a given frequency at a lower voltage, that that's a, a positive, right? The consumer would should favor that 1.4 volts versus a 1.6 or 1.7 volt module, right? So it's higher quality mm -hmm. and it's something the memory vendors don't always get a lot of credit for. But if you see a vendor have a particular speed at a lower voltage than say another module that, you know, that's your higher quality, right? The lower lowest voltage at the highest frequency, that's quality. That's what you want. So the consumer should really look for that. Um, and, uh, just because, you know, I might say that, you know, 1.4 volts, while it is taking some risk and it does affect longevity, it's, it's maybe a, a bit of a safer risk. Uh, you still want to seek to lower that, right? So could you find a module that can achieve that frequency at 1.35 volts or 1.3 volts? And um, yeah, so when you, when you see those modules out there that have a lower voltage for the same frequency as another, that's your quality module. So we've heard of like the topologies of DRAM right? Uh, daisy chain and T topology. And do you mind, or are you able to explain to us, like, what are the actual differences between these two things and what are the advantages of each, or is it not worth using one topology over the other? Yeah. So, um, that, that topology has to do with, um, if you have a board that supports, uh, two dims uh, per channel, it's how that, the, the, the two modules on one channel are configured uh so you know nowadays um we've seen the industry really move uh the daisy chain so almost everything for the two dims per channel is using daisy chain teach topology was something that was used in the past don't really see it used uh, much these days so uh, yeah that's kind of where things stand it's on daisy chain but the memory uh, board vendors i should say are always free to explore and try it. And we want them to test that, right? So that's when you buy an Intel, when you get an Intel reference design, uh, the board vendors are looking at those and saying, hey, is there a way I can tweak this uh, routing, this layout and uh, get superior uh, signal integrity? And we're all for them uh, challenging that. But most, for, for the most part, nowadays, you're gonna see, you're gonna see closer to that. Uh, you're, gonna, you're gonna see really daisy chain, but also, you'll see some boards that are only one dim per channel. So neither T topology nor daisy chain apply. And, uh, uh, and that's where your best signal integrity will be your, your cleanest, uh, clocks, your best layout, your the highest margin will be on those, uh, one dim per channel boards. And, and what do you call that layout? If there is a particular term for it, um, what you is know, that? There isn't, <laughs> uh, you know, it's really just a direct because um, that that T or Daisy chain uh, is really talking about you know, when you're sharing a single channel for two modules and how you kind of fan that out or how you route that. So yeah, it's uh, 
point to point is probably not the right word, but maybe it is uh, for one dip per channel. It's just very straightforward. It's the cleanest approach. So the only problem is if you, you give up the the upgrade path without swapping out your old modules, you know, and the, the capacity. But for most gamers, we were just talking about um, 48 uh, gigabyte modules, right? Boy, two 48 gigabyte modules is probably going to be more than you need. Um, you know, so I, personally, if I was going to you know, get a board, I would go one dim per channel if I cared about the uh, the bandwidth side. So I'm going to ask you um, about particularly uh, the performance of CU dims, right? Because we've seen like these major advancements. I mean, if I look back at Z690, where we started with DDR5 to where we are today, it's like huge, huge uh, differences, right, in frequency. And I wanted to ask, though, since we've got CU dims, would that ha or has that actually extended the life cycle of DDR5 or is it perhaps going to end up at the same place and we'll be looking at DDR6 uh, within the roughly the same 10 year, 12 year gap that we had? Yeah, I guess the short answer is yes. C CU DIMMs are, are going to help a lot with uh, some of that uh, signal integrity in the area of clocking. Maybe I should back up a step and just say the CU DIMMs essentially have a chip on them called the CKD. And that um, that that will redrive that clock. It'll make sure that the clock is very clean inside the module. Um, and so, when you're getting to really high uh, higher frequencies, um, the the cleanness of the clock you want that clock signal to be very clean. That uh, can be taken care of or enhanced by that uh, CKD. Um, so that's it helps there uh, for sure. Now, the interesting thing is we're kind of at that crossroads, right? We've just saw the introdu introduction of CU DIMMs, and it's great um, for the average uh, customer. For overclockers, uh, you know, there's opportunities too in the future, but right now um, we're at a threshold where you, you probably don't need that because the motherboard you're buying is an enthusiast Z board, uh, and, you, and your uh, signal integrity is often very clean because those motherboard vendors will really invest through PCB quality, layer count, very careful routing. They might do multiple spins of a PCB to get it just right. And so you might not yet see it in that space, uh, but in the future, that CKD will be very important. So I bring that up to explain why you might actually see some of the overclockers operating modules that have a CKD in what's called a bypass mode. And so they can actually bypass that CKD uh, so if they're not using the, the the clock enhancement capabilities of the CKD and they're just going direct. And the reason is CKDs will have an upper limit of the frequency they can attain. Because so if you're overclocking, you have to think my memory controller has to handle it, the DRAM has to handle it, the module, the board, all have to be able to handle that higher speed. Well, the CKDs do have an inherent limit because they have to be capable of that max overclock you're going after. And so if you're pushing it to the max today, you'll actually bypass that CKD. In the future, I think you're going to see CKDs that can operate at much higher speeds. Today, I think the best CKD I've seen uh, kind of tops around, out around that 9600 range, which is still like really high. So you can tell I'm talking about that above 9600 uh, area. Now, I think in the future, you'll see uh, CKDs you know, go much higher than that. What is the theoretical limit you think uh, exists for CU DIMMs in terms of this generation of CPUs, for instance? For CU DIMMs. So the real yeah. limit for CU DIMMs is going to be that CKD frequency capability we're just talking about. Most yeah. of those are going to top out around 9600. But don't throw out that CKD module. Those are still great because you're not going to operate at 10,000 mega transfers necessarily all day today. Maybe in a couple of years we can talk about that. So uh, CKD modules are great and they're flexible if they have that bypass capability. Uh, then then uh, you get around that CKD limit. Let's say you've got a good motherboard, like you were saying. Um, so now the real limit is uh, going to be the DRAM. That, that memory controller that I was trying to give credit to the Intel architects that designed it is truly amazing. And I'll give you an example of what I can kind of back this up with in a second. Um, but that there's just tons of headroom in that, that IMC today. As the DRAMs continue to improve their, their frequency capability, you're seeing frequencies 
eek upward. And so I, I kind of monitor this in terms of what's the, the world record frequency, even though, you know, the everyday user isn't going to see that world record frequency. It gives me an idea of how things are progressing and how people are kind of cherry picking DRAM to see how high they'll go. And right now it's something like 12,750 uh, ish mega transfers. I'm confident that it'll be over 13,000 mega transfers within a year, maybe, uh, maybe much sooner. Um, and it's just all a matter of getting uh, better and better DRAM. So anyways, long, long answer to tell you that I think that the number controller is not the bottleneck today. It can be, and it has been, you know, sometimes in the past, but we're really um, in a stage where you give us faster DRAM and you're going to see higher uh, frequencies. So that's pretty exciting. Oh, okay. It definitely is. So for the people who, Joe Average or whomever, we don't understand uh, why it's necessary even for us to be pursuing the limits of DRAM frequency and so forth. Everything that is learned there, according to what you're saying, does it then translate into the normal operating modes for the average user? So essentially you need the overclockers to push to the limit so that over some time, everything goes up. Um, essentially the, the, the usable frequency goes up for everybody. Spot on, Neo. This is what gets me up in the morning. This is what invigorates our team. Um, because today's overclocking is tomorrow's, you know, inspect speed frequency capability. Yeah, this is what drives us. So we, we love pushing the limits with overclocking because it does pathfind for what may in the future become kind of our, our uh, inspect. Absolutely. Yeah, and this, this theme comes up constantly. Uh, we love working with our partners inside the company who are focused more on, on, uh, in spec, uh, uh, frequencies, speeds, that sort of thing, because yeah, the learnings are just flowing between the two teams constantly. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And yeah, that's for all those people who don't understand why we do this. So <laughs> I do appreciate that. Right. All right, then I'm going to ask probably like, um, my closing questions about this. I wanted to find out, um, this has just been a curiosity of mine. We've all seen on the Core Ultra 200 uh, CPUs that uh, increasing the NGU ratio and the die to die ratio has like a sizable impact on performance, right? So the question is like, why was it set so low by default when there's, what we've seen at least is that you could actually increase it without increasing any voltage that seems to be tied to that operation. and. Does it not seem as if you're like leaving performance there or what did you left it for us to explore? Like why not increase it a little bit from where we found it essentially? Well, that's an insightful question and uh, you're pointing in the right direction. So here's the thing. Um, die to die and fabric are new overclocking knobs. Uh, sometimes fabric is called NGU, uh, next generation at door. Uh, these are like new tools in the overclockers toolkit. Uh, so uh, if you want to reduce your latency, could be a pretty good um, boost uh, to latency, and, and it shows up in gaming uh, benchmarks. So you can actually go try this. Um, yeah, it, here's the thing: the architecture uh, has changed a bit. Um, now we have instead of a monolithic die like we did on on a 12, 13, 4th and Gen and before, we now have a multi-chip solution. And so you have your compute die. Um, and then you have your, um, what we call a hub die, or you can think of it as an IO die. Then you have separately your graphics, uh, integrated graphics die. And as you're communicating from the hub die where the memory controller resides up to the compute die, um, that's where your uh, die to die interface is. So it's between those two chips. And then within that um, hub die is the next generation Uncore, also known as Fabric. And so you're essentially, um, speeding up or reducing the latency uh, of that interface from memory all the way out to compute. Okay. That does make sense though. Yeah. Cause I mean, we've seen it go up or at least in my personal experience, um, quite, quite a lot. You can actually increase it by 10 ratios almost. Um, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was wondering yes. why that was not exploited, like just as an out of the box, uh, uh, setting, but it's good that it is there anyway, so I can do this myself. Yeah, I mean, we, we, could, we could treat it as an Easter egg for overclockers right now. Um, and uh, yeah, you ask a good question. Maybe you'll see on the next uh, next generation that we might see those speeds go up. In fact, yeah, we can almost count on that. 
Um, the thing is, you have to match the the memory speed you're you're targeting with, you know, with with the whole uh, interface of the Dai and Fabric factored in. And you know, if you're running just in spec, then it's a little bit less of a uh, of a factor than it is when, when you're overclocking. So if you're going to overclock, you just you're going to want to overclock Dai and Fabric in addition to memory uh, in spec. You know, it may be less relevant, so that can drive those kind of decisions. Is there a particular ratio that as overclockers we should be aware of, or is it just there's not really uh, a relationship that we should be respecting in terms of memory frequency, the die to die ratio, and the encore ratio? You could say that uh, you want to keep things uh, proportional. Uh, so it would, you know, vary based on the frequency you're targeting. Um, I think uh, 3.2 gigahertz for both die to die and fabric which are both quite large overclocks, uh, are ideal uh, for 8,000 megatransfers. Um, but uh, we could probably have some heated, you know, overclocker to overclocker arguments about where that is, but the key is proportional. You want to remove any bottleneck and you can actually discover the truth on your own just simply by running those experiments, right? And you could maybe start with the suggestion I just supplied and then uh, maybe optimize from there. Right, based on what frequency you are running at. Um, and then, yeah, um, is there anything else that you like want to share about, particularly overclocking of uh, memory or this, just the general CPUs in general? Uh, uh, because there's a whole lot of info on 14th gen core and previous, but not so much on core ultra, right? So, is there anything that you would want to share with us that perhaps we didn't cover as media or it's just underappreciated or just poorly misunderstood? Uh, yeah, I think the the Core Ultra 200 series has really um, introduced a new architecture that overclockers uh, may may want to go ahead and start exploring because it it will be an architecture that's available in the future. Uh, and so, learning about the new interfaces, die to die fabric, uh, playing with Gear Two versus Gear Four, uh, these these concepts are going to be very relevant um, as we go into future generations. So definitely is a good time to embrace those. And then the, I guess the bigger picture is there's going to be lots of memory innovations in the coming years. Speeds are going to go up. Uh, I mean, what was overclocking when DDR5 came out, you know, on 12th gen is is now, um, you know, the overclocking max is now going to be our POR speeds, right? I mean, 6400 on 12th gen was kind of that sweet spot initially. Um, today it's 8000. Just wait until the next gen. What's uh, what the in spec memory speed is going to kind of be what today's overclocking is. So that's kind of fun. Um, you know, overclockers might want to play there. You're going to see module innovations. You know, this the CU DIMMs are really just starting to take off, but really taking advantage of CU DIMM and uh, some of those CKDs that are optimized for overclocking, I think is going to be another opportunity for module vendors uh, to work on. So yeah, um, the future with memory overclocking is is exciting. You know, we're already looking at uh, you know, down the road uh, DDR6 and getting ready for that from an overclocking perspective. So uh, yeah, it's, it's an exciting time to be overclocking. That's great. That's awesome stuff. Dan, thank you so much for your time. This has been insightful and I've learned a lot. And now I have more things to test because of all the things that you just said. All right. Thanks, thank Mio. So Reach out if you need anything.